This old-time radio program was originally aired live, long before the advent of high fidelity. As a result, you may detect an occasional surface noise or volume drop due to transmission problems so common to old radio. We hope, however, that any variance in audio quality will not take away from your pleasure in listening to this, one of the all-time favorite shows. for Thursday night here on Thames. At 7, Time Detective Sapphire and Steel investigate a ghost from the Great War. The girls who gave us flowers. At 7.30, this England visits the Cumbrian town of Millam, a town which, despite its declining industry, is still much more than just a name. While at 8, a death in the boxing ring leaves a question mark for Quincy. I don't care what you found or didn't find, Dr. Quincy. He was robbed. And I'll even tell you who did it. At nine, Jack on the Box. Novelist Jack Trevor Story looks back to his wartime childhood. Oh, baby, it's like me and Dickie Ducker never had it so good. His mum was sexy and mine was a Baptist, but not too often. At 9.30, it's all work and no pay for Shelley. They can't deduct that much. I'm afraid so. Not without a gun and a getaway car. <laughs> After the news, Miss Universe 1979 at 10.30. 75 lovely girls compete for the coveted title of the world's most beautiful woman. And with what the papers say at 11.45 and the Andy Williams show at 12, this is your Thursday night lineup here on Thames. Well, thank you, Mark, so much for being on the show. I really, really appreciate it. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing all about your story, your inspirations, and, and the history of, of really how you came to be and, and where that's led you to, to being in Vermont now and, and having a new exhibit at Gagosian. So if you don't mind, you know, introduce yourself a little bit for our listeners, and we'll take it from there. Sure, no problem. So my name is Mark Print. And I grew up in uh, Montreal. Um, I was born actually in Poland, but my parents came over from Europe after the war uh, in um, 1947. Uh, I was born, that's when I was born, but they came over also in 1947. I was probably only about six months old. And uh, they, of course, landed in New York, and then eventually they went to Montreal, Canada. And that's where I spent... Uh, my uh, school years uh, going all the way through university during that time. And right after university, um, well, I went through a fine arts program at uh, what was known then as Sir George Williams University in Montreal. And I had some great teachers who were well-known Canadian artists uh, at that time. They've since passed away. <laughs> uh, and... Um, I was actually majoring in uh, printmaking and uh, and painting, and I didn't actually take sculpture until uh, probably my uh, my third year in university. Oh wow! And uh, and I had been drawing all my life growing up uh, as a little kid, so uh, I was a pretty good drawer, and so I did rather well in um, in printmaking and in drawing classes, and uh, I think the big turning point for the direction that my work took happened uh, in right in the middle of a, a printmaking class where I was doing uh, drawings that were kind of like hyper-realistic type, type of drawings, and that lends itself well to printmaking. And I had a very nice, a very good teacher at the time, and uh, myself and one other student, we were sort of like, I would say, the stars of the class, right, where everybody thought that we were just great, and we thought we were just great. 
And so I went in for my uh, midterm kind of critique. Uh, and in those days, it's different from the way things I think are done now, but in those days you had an appointment to come in and you were going to have a, you know, a one-on-one with the teacher, not in front of the whole class or anything like that. And during class time, everything seemed to be going well, but it was mostly about a lot of techniques and less about the subject matter. Okay. So I sat down opposite my printmaking teacher, and I thought I was like on an A track, right? I was going to go right right to the top, no problem at all, because everybody admired me, and I was really good and, you know, self-confident and all of that. And she said to me, Mark, I have to tell you that if you continue working like this, I'm going to have to fail you. Oh, no. And it was like a real shock. I was like absolutely speechless. And when I finally caught my breath, all I could say was, but why? And she said, well, because you come in here and you have a good time and uh, you do a lot of talking. And, yes, you do lots of work and you're very, very good at what you do. And it comes very easily to you, and um, and that's the problem. Uh, you don't have to think about what you're doing. You could do it, you know, and talk and do everything else and have a good time, and, uh, y- and you're not challenging yourself. Uh. And she said that if another student had reached the level of competence in drawing that you have, I would have to give them an A because they'd have to work so hard to get there. And you don't have to work at it at all. And I can tell you that when you come back from the Christmas break, if you don't change, you're not getting through this class. It's as simple as that. (laughs) And so I left in shock, but I did understand what she was saying. It did, you know, everything made perfect sense to me. But, of course, I had to then uh, think about that and and probably change somewhat, you know. And... um, and this friend of mine, who was the other star of the class, he was really great. He was like, you know, a kind of, um, I would say sort of like a Rauschenberg type of guy, you know. He was like okay. way out there, and he did really interesting uh, imaginative work. And we did were he, very did good he friends. Stick with print, did he stick with printmaking? Uh, he was in printmaking with me in my class, oh, yeah. Gotcha. And... Um, and we used to go and shoot some pool uh, uh, after printmaking class because neither one of us had a class in between. And pool was a big passion for me because growing up, uh, my friends were out going uh, playing pool, and particularly the snooker mm-hmm. uh, on the big tables. And they were able to get into the pool halls because they looked like they were 16 and they didn't need an ID. And I looked like I was about 12, so (laughs) they weren't going to let me in, (laughs) and they didn't. So my friends all had about a year ahead of me. So when I finally got to 16, and I went in and I decided I was going to be – I loved the game pool. And I played pool day and night during the summer when I didn't – when I wasn't in school. And my big big sort of dream was to become a professional pool player. Oh, nice. So – but I hadn't – I was only now – you know, in, uh, you know, in, in, in university. So, you know, and I wasn't, I hadn't really found my, my dream stride, so to speak in art. So I wasn't necessarily thinking that I would be an artist, but, uh, around that time when I take, took my first sculpture class, I had a lot of problems in sculpture because I couldn't get something going because I didn't have any ideas. And, uh, You know, students were on their second and third piece of, you know, molding and casting something. And I was, I was work, tried to work with clay, with plaster, this and that. And nothing was happening for me. It was somewhat depressing because I was good at everything else uh, in, in art and school. So one day I was uh, down at a, in an area where I used to work in the summers and, uh, it was a a place called Universal Ship Supply, and it was like a uh, an army surplus store. Okay. And I went in there, and I knew the place because I had been in there many times before when I used to work nearby there. And I bought this World War One gas mask, and I only bought it because I liked it as an object. I didn't have any ideas of what that was going to use it or do something with it. I just liked it, and I just bought it. So it was a just a visual sort of attraction to it as an object, not necessarily what it represented or anything else, 
just the toe form and everything. It was just a weird looking thing, and I liked it and I related to it some on some it's level. It's a cool aesthetic, yeah. Yeah. And so that day I happened to have a sculpture class. So I was late for my class, so I'd gone from this place where I'd bought this mask into the sculpture class, and it suddenly occurred to me at that particular moment, as soon as I walked into the class, that the mask being rubber, I could pour like plaster or something into it, and it would peel off, and I would have a facial sort of figurative image that wasn't super realistic but wasn't so abstract that you couldn't identify with it. And so I did that, and I loved the result of that. And that put me on a path of the object having inspired an idea. And the idea wasn't uh, – and, and, and then I just did something with the mask and, and created a sculpture with it, basically. And uh, I didn't make it look like a gas mask but I, because I used the interior of the mask and I didn't, my first piece didn't actually have the canister. It had part of the the tubing leading to the canister, but it wasn't a reproduction of the entire gas mask. It was and the I had actually squished by. the mask when I made the plaster casting so that it came out sort of as a, a kind of horizontal elongated head. And uh, and I love that. So it uh, um, you know it's it sort of between what happened with that and what happened with my uh, printmaking teacher, I suddenly realized that I was onto something that gave me a great deal of joy, joy and excitement. And uh, it was like it was great. It was like being on it was like being on a super high, you know. And well, you so I did a lot a of things using. Yeah. Yeah, I did a lot of things using the mask, and uh, and then I went on to other things. Uh, some of the early pieces I did was I even took just part of the mask or just part of a casting of the mask, and uh, uh, I uh, cast it, and it kind of looked like something like a squished head, and I rolled out some some clay over the floor of this studio working at night in the sculpture studio because... I couldn't work in the day because I needed all the clay and I needed a lot of the space on the floor. So I realized the only way I could do that was to wait till classes were over and do it at night. And the teachers didn't ha- had no problem with that. So and I pushed that cl- that uh, casting of this squished sort of mask face into the clay. And then I, uh, a friend of mine had a, a bike tire there from a motorcycle, and I rolled that over the clay, which picked up the imprint of the clay. And I had a raincoat slick jacket, uh, one of those rubber things, one of those mm-hmm. yellow rubber things, and I put that down, and then I made a mold of the whole thing, which was probably about six feet long by about three feet wide, and I cast it in resins by doing a, like a reverse color painting, which I was just learning to do, and it came out great, and it was the title of the piece was Hit and Run. It was, represented somebody being run over on uh, on the roadway, so to speak. Ah, uh, Okay. And so that set off a a kind of direction for me, but I wasn't really thinking in terms, I, I say a direction because I'm looking back in retrospect, but at that time I didn't see it as a direction for anything. You know, I just was in love with the work and the idea and the materials and everything else and the objects and so on and so forth. But the object itself, you know, was uh, a key to probably everything that I did from then on all the way to to today because what I do is I just collect objects if I can afford them <laughs> that are interesting and uh ultimately those objects inspire ideas so rather than have an idea and seek out an object to complete the idea it's the other way around I would say most people don't work that way most artists have an idea, and then they go and they get the things they need to complete the idea. For me, it's not like that at all. The inspiration comes from the object. If I don't have an object, I don't have any inspiration, but I'm never at a lack for inspiration because I have objects around all the time. Sometimes, often when I buy an object, sometimes I'm looking for a particular object, but often um, I, I'm I usually I'm not looking for a particular object. I just see something or find something eBay today is a great source for anything and everything. I could Google oh, yeah. 
I could Google some uh, sort of generalized uh, topic or subject matter and thousands of images will come up, you know, and I just scroll through them <clears throat> and I find something interesting, then I see if it's something I, I can afford or not. So I don't buy something because I have an idea for it or I see it and I have a good idea because if I like it, I know an idea will come for it or with it eventually. It's just a question of time. And I'm not in a hurry because I have lots of objects around. I have more ideas and more objects than I can, you know, probably ever do. Who knows, right? But and, uh, and that means it can evolve as it goes as well. So since, you know, since different objects could inspire you, you may be going a certain direction at one point, but then see something else that you want to incorporate and have it go a completely different way, right? Yes, exactly. And so a great deal of that happens. So it's a it's a kind of a journey, you know. It's a it's a much longer way of working than let's say let's say if you have a if if an artist has a particular idea and then they're on the path to that finished fixed image in their mind, uh, that's a kind for me. Uh, and everybody chooses their own path. I'm not suggesting my path is a better path or a more creative path than their path is. No, all I'm saying is for me that doesn't work because. I think if I knew exactly how it would look like when it was finished, I wouldn't bother doing it because there'll be no excitement in it for me. Right. And I want right. to be, I want to be excited by what I'm doing. I want it to be a journey of discovery as I go along. And often, whatever idea I start with with the object will often change as I work because I see something else happening in it, something that's more interesting than let's say whatever my initial idea was. And I will always go down that path, that unknown path. So working like that is a much longer process because sometimes you have to retrace steps or go back and change something in order to now make it work for another idea. So it's an intuitive process, and the inspiration always comes from the object. So almost any time... Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, when you were a kid, did you read any of those old monster magazines, things like that, that were, you know, that you could buy the old plaster uh, monster masks and things like that? Uh, no, actually, when I was a kid, I had uh, uh, classic comics. Oh, okay, okay. You know, and they were, like, great because they were better than the regular comic books because they had a longer story to them. And and they were based, of course, on on – on famous literature, a lot of them, but I wasn't interested in that because of the fame, because of the literature history to them. I just liked the stories better, you know. Yeah. So um, I think I would have liked uh, those other comics also, but they weren't the things that I sort of bought with my weekly allowance or collected or anything like that, you know. So because I remember I in the back, where, yeah, I remember my the... interest Take would have a... come from let's say some of the weirder things that uh that I created in terms of artwork. Uh I can't say that, you know, thinking back from when I was a kid that there was anything uh you know, I'd like to go to let's say if I went to if my parents took me uh oh to the uh the um oh the parks where they had the circuses and things like that, you know. Mm. I was fascinated by the circuses, you know. So I would always go into all those haunted houses type of things and and all those other things. Uh, so, yeah, but I didn't – it didn't uh, – and so I was fascinated by all of that. Uh, but it, I don't wouldn't say that then, you know, that that had some impact on mm. anything I was doing at the time in terms of drawing because I was doing, like, super realistic things. I remember – my friend said to me around the same time before the teacher told me that she was going to fail me if I continued. <laughs> he said to me on one time when we were leaving the, the printmaking room and we we're going to play pool, he says to me, Mark, you need to stop doing that Norman Rockwell shit. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, Norman Rockwell isn't shit, but I'm just saying, you know, for our time when we were there, you know, Norman Rockwell was not considered in the university that we were at, the thing to be doing. 
you know. Right, and that was like a transition out of that period then. Yeah, and also Norman Rockwell is Norman Rockwell. Why would you want to do something that somebody has already done, you know? Right, right. So, uh, but <laughs> he just had a funny way of expressing it. But, um, uh, yeah, I don't think he, he thought Norman Rockwell was was shit, but, you know, he didn't think that we should be doing that, you know. And that's what made our work, let's say my work, shit, in his opinion, because, you know, he said, well, you need to stop doing that. So, uh, and I had a great deal of respect for him because he was doing the kind of painting that was sort of more like towards Francis Bacon. Okay. And that was a big influence. He turned me on to Francis Bacon, and, and I would say Bacon's paintings had an influence in a way uh, for my work. But I would say that different artwork that, Different artworks that I that I saw uh, when I was in university, and there were there were bus trips going all the time from uh, from the Mont- from Montreal, the university down to New York City, and uh, we would uh, these bus trips were just for students, you know. So they would you could get there very inexpensively. I think they were like twenty bucks or something, and you could uh, go by bus. The bus would leave at midnight. You'd get there in New York City around six or seven in the morning and you'd have to hang around so the galleries opened up and then uh they would leave you had to be at back at the bus depot something like about ten or eleven o'clock at night and the bus would leave to go back to Montreal and if you weren't there it would leave without you. <laughs> so we saw a lot of a lot of exhibitions in New York City and so we were very very clued into what was the latest of everything. And it was a great time because there was a huge variety of work being done. There wouldn't, wouldn't, it wasn't any particular style that was more popular than another. So you go to New York City, you could see a Frank Stella exhibition, which is, you know, abstract versus a Rauschenberg or versus um, a Dwayne Hansen or, I, I don't know, the, you know, a Rosenquist or a yeah, Lichtenstein. Yeah, you could see like a tremendous variety of different uh Andy Warhol, a tremendous variety of different kinds of artwork being done. So, it was very um it was an exciting time, you know. I don't think that art has ever had such a an exciting variety of different types of work that were all so popular all at the same time, you know what I mean? Right. No, that was a uh, almost a rebirth, yeah. you know, of of the uh Sure. You know, it's it, you look now, and it's it's almost going towards the more uh, street artist caliber. But back then, it just you had one after the other, like you say, Lichtenstein, Andy Warhol, where and and, and Bacon that were just these incredible artists that everything they put out was just this masterpiece almost. Right. And and you don't you don't have that. Uh, and I I don't know if it's inspiration now. I don't know what changed exactly in the, in the medium, but Something you know. I don't know. So after yeah. So I would say that when I saw artists' works, um, they didn't influence me in terms of the subject matter of what I was creating, but they influenced me in the sense that, um, let's say, if it was an artist that that I related to, let's say Francis Bacon, you know, whose work I, I I loved, and and still do, but it. What what did influence me in a sense was that it gave me a certain kind of confidence to know that there was other work out there that was out there on the cutting edge and and being like related a kind of related subject matter in the terms of taking the human figure and changing it or reinterpreting it in some way, right. um, distorting it, whatever, however you want to phrase it, but that that gave me the confidence to continue down my path, which was not a path that was influenced in terms of their images being similar to my images, but just that the the impact of uh, the emotional impact was the same. You know what I mean? Got it. Got it. So and you could so, see that it would evolve and what you, what you could evolve yeah. into as well. Yeah. And when I graduated from university – because I happen to have teachers teaching at that particular university that well that were well known Canadian artists, they got they I they were they offered to 
give me recommendations for and that I should apply for Canada Council grants, which are, you know, the Canadian version of, um, you know, of arts grants, uh, maybe the Canadian version of the uh, the endowment, the, uh, you know, national endowment or or organizations like that. Okay. But the Canadian ones were much uh, less conservative than, say, the national endowment. Uh, so they were looking for much more interesting or, uh, work. And some of these teachers were actually on some of these juries. So I was very fortunate in that I got a number of Canada Council grants in my first few years after graduating from university. And when I first graduated, my, one of my teachers said, well, you should go and see Ed Keenholz. So, uh, and I knew Keenholz's work because I'd seen some of that. Uh, and uh, in books, and so on and so forth. And that work was probably, because it was sculpture, it kind of related to to probably what I was doing the closest. So um, I was on a grant, and with a grant came a, a traveling uh, grant with it, So, which meant that I could go pretty much anywhere, and they would cover my return airfare expenses. So nice. I decided to phone Ed Keenholz and so uh, at the time I was living just in a one and a half room apartment and I picked up the phone and I just phoned information for LA and they gave me his number just like that. You can't do that today. You're not no. going to get a hold of anybody that's well known that way, right? So, but in those days, yeah, and I and I got him on the phone and I said, you know, I'm a young artist here in, in Montreal, Canada and um there are, people, there are professional artists here who suggested that I give you a call and see if you know if you'd be willing to see me and uh you know and um and I would love to be able to to meet him. So he said to me, "Well, why don't you send me some slides of your work? Because in those days everything was like on 35 millimeter slides, you know." Mm-hmm. And uh, sent me some slides. And he gave me his address, and I sent him these slides. And uh, obviously, he wasn't going to be interested in seeing me unless he thought that I, I was doing something that was worthwhile, right? Right, <laughs> so I think so. So he wanted yeah. to see the work. And then, anyway, after a couple of weeks, he gave me a call back, and he said, I looked at your work. It's great. Come and see me anytime. Just let me know when you want to come. I'll pick you up, and uh, you can stay for you can stay with me for a while, like meaning for a few days, and... Uh, and and so on, you know, and uh, and I did. I flew to L.A., you know, uh, I don't know, I, whenever it was, uh, you know, whether it was a few weeks or a few months or a couple of months later, it was in the summertime, and uh, and he picked me up, and we went to his place. He was living in Laurel Canyon up on the, on the way up on the top uh, where you could, where it was so high up there, you could see the smog below and then, and then the city below the smog. So he was above the smog. Wow. Yeah, and it was great. We got along great, and he bought a couple of my pieces, which was terrific. And so it was a great, it was a great thing for me because, uh, um, you know, he didn't feel like I was copying him, and I didn't feel I was copying him either. Even though I would say that our our works, even though we didn't work the same way, they are probably most related in terms of. I don't know the power or the subject matter, uh, and what's be- what was being done with the human figure then or even now. So um, at the time, then he also told me about this grant that he had been on, which was called the DAAD, which is the uh, Berlin Art Program grant, and it's a grant that's open to artists from all over the world in any in any kind of um, be a writer, you could be a sculptor, you could be a painter, you could be a performance artist, you could be anything. It doesn't matter. Okay. Um, and it's, it's obviously a, a kind of competition, but they try to take a variety of artists and they have, um, so that would have been in 1974. And I think I met Ed around 1972 or, yeah, it would have been 1972, sometime around then, and uh, or 71. Maybe I met Ed in 71. So, uh, and then, anyway, I applied for the grant, got the grant, went over there in 1974, and Ed was had a uh, had an apartment and studio in Berlin, and uh, we would we would be together all the time, 
over there. You know, I'd go to his place for supper. I went there with my wife, uh, and um, and he had his wife there. I think maybe that was his third wife or his fourth wife. I'm not <laughs> sure. And uh, that was uh, Nancy. How close? So. How close were you to East Berlin? Oh, we went we went over to East Berlin a number of times. Because that was such a strange, like, you know, this, this monolithic, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, industrial yeah. Soviet style that is now, it's a stylish icon almost, you know, that those times of yeah. the, the East Berlin style. So how did that affect your your creating, you know, your, your mentality oh, of your art? Well, then? you know, East Berlin looked like a ghost town practically, you know what I mean? There was like right. nothing going on there. And, I mean, people went there just to see, you know, what it was like, you know what I mean? But, uh, I mean, they had some very good theater there because I remember when my, uh, when my father came over to Berlin, uh, to visit us, uh, we went with him to East Berlin and he wanted to go and see some theater or something like that. So we bought tickets and we went to, uh, some plays and they were, they were very high quality, uh, very high quality theater that they had there. But, but, the the city itself was kind of dead, you know. It's like, and then and then we had to get out by a certain time in the evening, right. and so and then of course before you go over there, on the way over there, or when you get there, they take your passport away, it disappears, and everybody gets very nervous, and then it shows up at the other end of this uh, kind of uh, whole system that they have. But it's not like it's in front of you, you know. <laughs> so right. You get a little so bizarre. <laughs> you wonder whether you're going to get out there, out, out of there. Right. Um, but yeah, it didn't influence anything. Uh, but it was it was a funny thing because um, during the winter, if you listen to the radio on uh, on the American radio, uh, they would say, or on West German radio, they would say. The ice is very thick, and on the east side, they would say the ice is very thin because they didn't want people trying to escape. <laughs> oh, 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 nice. Oh, <laughs> because bigger. that was one way you could get across out of there is to go over like frozen water. But there were lots of other areas where they there was just rubble, you know, and people would try to get through all the rubble to get to to the wall. <clears throat> so there wasn't right. like one wall. There was a wall on the west side. And there was a wall on the east side, and there was a snowman's land in between. And that's what a people weird were time. getting killed. Right. People were sometimes trying to get over uh, the east wall. <clears throat> and even if they did, and even if they made it over the no man's land, they could be shot just trying to climb up onto the west wall. Just And they were like literally like a couple of feet away from freedom, right? Right. There's a few shot. movies. There are a few movies that, that like that was the last scene is them getting shot climbing the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Man, yeah. go figure. It's just a, such a strange backwards moment in history, you know, one of many. Yeah, and all along the west side, along the wall, at different areas, you can see markers where people have been killed. They made it over the wall, but they were shot, Jeez. you know, on top of the wall. And, you know. So you, so you were there for you were about a cut, like two years? Yeah, I was there for two years. And then I had, uh, and I had a big show there. Uh, and. Then I had another exhibition at the Stedlick Museum in 1978 because when I had my show in in West Berlin, there was another uh, the Kunsthalle in Nuremberg in Nuremberg, Germany, um, uh, took that show and showed my work. And then sometime later, the Stedlick Museum people came to me, one of the curators, when we were still in Berlin. And said we would like to give you a show, or like to take the show that you know that's here now. And but we're booked up for a year. But this is what we can do if you're willing to. They said we could store your work for a year, and uh, and then give you a show because we can't afford for your work to go back to to Canada or wherever, and then ship it back here uh, later. You know. So right. I said, no, great, store it for a year, and you know, I'll have a show. And so, uh, yeah, that's what happened. So I had and a everything, and everything show worked at the Stedlick Museum. And they actually, everything was safe when they stored it. Nothing happened. I, you know, I would have been terrified leaving my work and not necessarily knowing what's going on for a year. Oh, no. The Stedlick Museum is, a, is in Amsterdam. It's a reputable museum. Gotcha. 
So you actually went back to the uh, back to Canada and then went back out a year later. Yeah, I went back to Canada and then actually the Stedlick said to me that you have a choice. We have ex we have a certain amount of money. We can either make a nice, really nice catalog for your exhibition of your work that's already here that we have in storage, or we can ship over some other piece for you. And I said, let's ship over another piece. That, In retrospect, I think that was almost a mistake because it would be nice to have a really good catalog, you know. Yeah. They did pr- produce a catalog, but it was just a very small thing. But I understood that they, they had limited funds. So the piece I was working on, in Canada at the time that went over to the Stedlick for 1978 for my show there, I worked on in, on that in 1977. And that piece was called Where Had Possessor Been Possessed, One Confusing in Instance, the Other with Design. So don't ask me about the title because my wife <laughs> actually makes up most of the titles from my Oh, pieces. cool. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, But that's a piece where there's – uh. Uh, it's a room that's a, uh, <clears throat> a self-contained room, which would means all the panels go and bolt together and get set up within a room of, of say, uh, um, uh, a show. Right. So instead, they gave me something like seven rooms, uh, and so this piece was in one of those rooms. So at that time, I was doing some big environmental pieces, okay. and uh, it had pedestals uh, with um, uh, plexiglass cylinders and the pedestals were lit from underneath, which would light the pedestal, uh, which would light the plexiglass cylinders, which were filled with water and heads. And uh, each head had a different expression on a di- on the pedestals, and bubbles would come out of the mouth and nostrils. And then at the very back was a uh, crucifix uh, aquarium that I had made um, over there. And uh, and bubbles came out of the figure that was in the crucifix in a crucifix cl- cross that was actually an aquarium. <laughs> okay. A very elaborate That's awesome. piece. Wow. Yeah. So that's the piece actually that many years later, and I remember what date that was. That that piece was the piece that prompted uh, the art director of Island Records to phone me up um, uh, from England and tell me that they were doing a limited edition of Head Like a Hole, Trent Reznor's um, uh, uh, Nine Is Nails song, yeah, <laughs> and uh, and they wanted to use that image for a poster that they would be giving away with the record. I mean, they okay. weren't giving away the record, but they were, they, the poster came with the record. Right, right. Um, and I said, great, sure. And so uh, and they were paying me really well for it, just for just for going yes and sending them an image, right? So they said, well, we're going to go. I, he, he flew over from uh, Amsterdam to Burlington, Vermont, where... Uh, I actually live in St. Albans, which is not far from Burlington, about a half an hour away from Burlington, and uh, came to my place, stayed overnight, and the next day we flew to New Orleans, where at the time Trent Reznor lived, and met him and his manager for supper, and they finalized this deal, and uh, they produced the record. And uh, sometime later, shortly after, Trent Reznor reneged on the contract with Island Records and uh, uh, went with a bigger label in the U.S. and that was the end of <laughs> of your representation with it. Yeah, gotcha. right. So uh, yeah, so then Trent Reznor got his own, you know, friends. He's surrounded by artists, I guess, and and they are doing everything, uh, you know, as far as the images go. But so, uh, so when that happened, I mean. When, because you've you've faced uh, I guess a number at least from from the outside looking in, you've faced a number of experiences where like in your your 1974 exhibit that you had to to fight you know to not have that shut down and then your subsequent exhibit after that once again you had to fight legal battles to not be shut down, and then you know this experience with uh, with Island Records and Nine Inch Nails there must have been a number of times throughout your career where. You've had to deal with just this the, the bullshit of either the business 
or the bullshit of, uh, of uh, people that don't understand what you're trying to convey with your art and, and are, are seeing it as something that is, uh, you know, brutal or something that is, you know, uh, too provocative or, or too disturbing for, which is so close minded. But, you know, when you would deal, when you'd be dealing with these trials, you know, what did you learn from them? How did you get through them? And how did you, you know, become uh, well, better you know, from the process? Well, I, I <laughs> you know, the current resident thing was not, um, I mean, I, I think he, I think his manager liked my work. I think he liked my work. They just had a preference to go with somebody else, which is fine. I don't think they rejected my work because it was too tough or anything like that. I just think that he probably just wanted to go with his friends, which was okay. I didn't find that uh, – well, I mean, uh, obviously, if he had stayed with Island Records, Island Records probably would have continued with my images and probably convinced him that, you know, I had something good to offer because right. he didn't reject my images. You know, he didn't think that, well, he had some other preference, but he was forced into – it because of Island Records. I think Island Records pitched it to him, and he looked at it, and he thought it was cool, and, you know, and we went like that because when we had dinner, you know, he was we 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 were very nice to each other, you know. So um, I didn't get but a feeling a of any of kind of yeah, just a matter of circumstances. Yeah, you know, it was fine. But yes, the business is the business, right? And I don't have any control of that. Even Island Records doesn't have it didn't have any right. control of that, right? Right, right. Like, it's all about money, right? So. um yeah, they just went with a big record, a bigger record label, and I think his manager even said to me at that time, sometime later, when this thing was falling apart, that he would contact me, and he thought that we could still use some of my images, but I never heard back from him, so it it didn't happen. But the other thing with um, the whole story with my uh, um, my, I think it was my first show in 1972 was that the um uh the uh, uh that was my first show with the Isaacs Gallery in uh Toronto uh Canada and um and someone from the um the Western Guard which was I think is also known as the Edmund Burke Society which is the equivalent to it's not related to, but it's the equivalent of the John Birch Society in the U.S. You know, it's a right-wing conservative group. They started picketing in front of the gallery to say that it was against the Christian way of life. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and so, of course, all the images I had there were kind of strong images of human bodies and uh, pretty badly messed up. And... Um, you know, I had uh, a delicatessen, which showed human body parts being, you know, uh, as meat, and so on and so forth. So um, they objected to pretty much everything <clears throat> that I had in that exhibition, and uh, and what and who, one of the um, I don't know the um, uh, leaders of the Edmund Burke Society of the Western Guard. Uh, went to the police and signed a formal complaint. So when somebody signs a formal complaint, the police have to go and look at what's going on. So the police came to see the show, and at the time, uh, I was not in Toronto, meaning I set up my show, my exhibition, I went back home to Montreal, and this happened, you know, probably, so let's say my show was on for three weeks or, or something like that. So maybe about a week later, this is what occurred. So the police came, and they, at the time, Toronto had a very poor reputation in terms of, uh, I don't know, um, houses of ill repute and all kinds of things like that. And there was a big push on cleaning up Toronto and okay. trying to make it uh, nice. <laughs> Wholesome, yeah, got it. Got and it. so, unfortunately, quite by coincidence, my work fell into the overall um, feeling that this was part of Toronto's problem. <laughs> wow. And so they told the gallery owner that he had to close the show. So my dealer, Ab Isaacs, refused to close the show. He said, no, I'm not closing your show. It's an artwork. It's an art exhibition. And, you know, do your cleanup somewhere else. It has nothing to do with us or what we're showing or Mark Prent's work. Um, and eventually... Okay, so that was pretty much the end of it, but it made a lot of press, and a lot of people still today think that my show 
back then was closed, but it was never closed. They asked, they told him to close it, but he refused to close it, and they didn't push that any further because they didn't know what to do because there are no, you know, there were no laws that said that he couldn't show this work. But okay. eventually it went to, to court because the Western Guard pushed it to that point. Wow. And uh, when the Isaacs Gallery... Um, and, and so, by the way, the the law they used was a law that dated back to, I think, around 1877 or something like that. that of you course. Cannot knowing, you cannot knowingly exhibit to public view a disgusting object. Okay. Okay, so that's like a federal law that goes way, way back to, you know, the, um, the yeah, the late 1800s, uh, where they were trying to prevent the showing of freaks, like real freaks and things like that, you know, um, and trying to make money off of that. Uh, so eventually, when it went to, when it went to court, which took quite a while, that took like another year or something. The judge threw it out, you know, on the basis that that term disgusting can be interpreted any number of ways. Uh, uh, you know, one person's idea of disgust could be another person's idea of pleasure, and it means nothing, you know. So, but unfortunately, what it did was it scared a lot of the public galleries, like the big museums, Canadian museums, away from showing that work, uh, uh, which otherwise they might have very likely have shown you know my my work you know i would say let's say sometime after my exhibition <laughs> with isaacs or someplace sometime like that they probably would have shown some of the probably would have given me at some point uh, an exhibition i mean it's just conjecture one doesn't know for sure but what it did do was it scared a lot of people because they didn't want to have to fight that fight themselves or have to defend it on some level you know they were right. happy to defend a pe- you know, because people would come and say, is this what my taxpayer's money going to? But, of course, people still do that. And, you know, if some big blue painting comes up, which is all blue, and they go, I don't, and somebody in the public decides that's not art, and they go and they see somebody, and they know that's their taxpayer's money, and uh, they go, is that art? They don't have a problem defending that because, you know, it's fairly innocuous. Like, how upset can you be about a blue painting, right? Oh, right, right. <laughs> However, if you take the human figure and you distort it, there could be plenty of reasons why people are upset, you know? Yeah, I think because so, it's challenging the mind and, and it's challenging our understanding of form, you know, and, and maybe that's a part right. of it, but it's mostly just being closed-minded. Yeah, so it's, uh, you know, that was a... That probably was maybe the worst thing that probably could have happened to me um, uh, then or at any time, you know, uh, where, you know, it gets blown completely out of proportion. And all it takes is like one person doing one thing. And I'm sure you have that with actors, actresses and people in film and everything. You know, they could be great at something and they get a nice reputation at the beginning of their career. Then they get one little one part where because the script might be bad, they can't do a good performance, and all of a sudden they they're nobodies anymore. You know what right. I mean? Oh, it happens all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it happens all the time. Sure, and they could be very talented, but what does it mean, right? Right. Yeah. You 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 get trapped into something that you take because you need the money or this or that, and you don't do a great performance because of whatever it has, it has nothing to do with what your acting ability might be. It has to do with the script. If the script is lousy, how are you going to do a good job? Right. Right. You're just a cog. Yeah, you're just a cog in the wheel kind of thing. Yeah. And then right. suddenly you're <laughs> you're back to the beginning and maybe nobody ever discovers you again or maybe you do come back somehow, you know. It's, well, like now, a, you, you everything's a big lottery. Back. Right. Well, you can you've come back incredibly now being a Gagosian and and you know, selling works uh, in you were in a film with Pierce Brosnan where uh, or some of your work was displayed in a film with him. And, uh, yeah, you know, he, it was uh, the the film. Well, it's not a memorable, uh, a terribly memorable film, but <laughs> the film's title was Entangled, and it was with Pierce Brosnan and Judd Nelson. And uh, the director, uh, want, who liked my work a lot, uh, was looking for some, was looking for a reason to show it, and so he had a part in the film where the character Judd Nelson plays is looking for his girlfriend and goes to her place and finds an invitation 
on her couch or table or something for an exhibition opening, which is my name and my exhibition opening, right? And he goes to it, and in that process of him looking for her, you see a whole exhibition set up in, in multiple rooms, just like a real exhibition. So it was like a, a really ideal thing for an artist. Yeah, I mean, if you ever perfect. want to have a have your work being shown in a film, what better way than to have it shown as part of an art exhibition, right? Because right. that's what it is. Start making friends with directors. Pardon? You know? <laughs> Start making friends with directors, you know? Yeah. So, so and, and, and you basically had that, because uh, was that shot in Canada, or did you have to ship all that out to California to be shot? For what? For the film? No, the film was being shot in Canada. Oh, okay, okay, got it. Yeah, and so Pierce Brosnan came there, to, uh, was in, shot in Montreal. So Pierce Brosnan came to Montreal, Judd Nelson came to Montreal, and, uh, you know, and the whole the whole crew was over there. Yeah. So how did this translate from, from you having those first two exhibits – uh, where you did face a little bit of a public outcry, and then being in Germany and, and traveling around the world doing exhibits at uh, you know different different uh, galleries around the world, to I would say maybe the late '80s is when you started making things like the uh, you know some of your your most famous pieces that are now being shown at Gagosian. Like so, what what was the transition there? For obviously the you did come back quite a bit, you know, where you did face that bit of adversity. Yeah, yes, but you know, uh, but in a way, I mean that that's 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 you looking at it from the outside, right? Right. right. <laughs> okay. So looking at it the inside, I'm now going to tell you a money story, okay? Okay. Which is um, that not and and this money story is an example of one of many things, and how money is is everything, meaning. You know, if you if you don't have money for food and you don't have money for paying bills, whether it's rent or your mortgage or electricity or heat or uh, or or anything, um, you know, the, the 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 list can go on and on of all the basic needs that you need that one has to have that has to be bought paid for, but with money, then money is everything. You know, people right. who say money isn't everything. Obviously, money is not everything to them because they have money. So, you know, but even even if people will say, and a classic example of that is people will say, oh, well, health is more important than money. You know, this is like a, maybe even a kind of standard uh, answer, which is nonsense because you need money in order to be healthy. You know, yeah. if you get sick and you go to the doctor, you can't go to the doctor. You can't get prescriptions. You can't get medicine. You can't get an operation or surgery or this or that unless you have money to pay for it, you know? Right. So you will you could easily die or be in extreme pain for the rest of your life because you don't have the money to pay for it, you know? If you're over 65, it's not a given that also everything is paid for because it's not. Medicare only covers 80%. What do you do with the other 20%? You need right. to have additional insurance. If you can't afford additional insurance and you can't afford to pay the the additional 20%, it's not like you can go in and have surgery for 80% of what the surgery is. Oh, just do 80% and I'll live with the rest of it for the 20, yeah. and lose the 20%, right? That's not the way it works. So money is everything. So now I'll tell you a little money story, okay? This is a really, this is, I mean, so by the way, getting back to like depression or adversity, um, I have known two uh, two artists who have taken their their own life. They don't know each other. They're from different parts of the of the country, based on uh, just based on financial stress. You know, right? Not having enough money to pay bills, where it reaches the point that you're in so much debt that it's just too overwhelming. You know, you don't see any light at the tunnel, your credit cards are maxed out, you have no money, you have nothing, and you don't see any other way out. And these two people that I know had exactly that kind of problem. One of them okay. went into debt for many years, like maybe, you know, more than a decade, two decades, and finally became too much for him, took his own life. The other one was much younger, 
but also in debt up to the eyeballs and, you know, no way out, can't see a way out. And so it just becomes so depressing. So depression, I'm not talking now about a clinical um, definition of of, uh, depression. I'm talking about one that's purely financial, which is completely different from a clinical type of depression. You know, what, what, what I finally have discovered or, uh, uh, if, if it's at all an answer is that any little thing, doesn't matter how small it is, good that happens, you have to hang on to that. You have to cling to that. Right. This is what it comes down to, you know? So I could have a show somewhere, like even at a Goshen Gallery or, or any place. Uh, certainly, Goshen is a wonderful place to show. You couldn't ask for anything better. But any kind of a show that I could that I've had, say before that, or anywhere else, you know, these are things I just I just have to pray that something comes from them because if nothing does, I mean, the shows don't cost me money because the dealers or the, or the art galleries generally pay for that. But you know, we still have to have an income rolling in somehow. You know to pay for our regular expenses and stuff like that. And while our son was growing up, we had to help him pay pay for his schooling and for this and that and various other things. And all these things cost money. So it's not like you have a whole lot of choice except to try to make money somehow. And um, yes, it's very difficult. You just have to hope that, you know, I had a business for a while where I was selling life molding um, <clears throat> materials, which is what I do for my own work is life molding, life molding and casting. Right. And uh, at the beginning, we did extremely well. And, and and it looked like, you know, I could probably make a living from this the rest of my life, you know, and still do my work. Uh, but at some point, um, the bigger... Uh, companies that were uh, selling molding materials but not life molding realized that there's a huge market for life molding, meaning there are hundreds of thousands of people who want to either mold their infants' hands or their feet or their dog's feet or this or that. That molding and casting when it comes to skin safe uh materials is huge because it's like it's not as if because it's sort of like a cottage industry you know there are many 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 hundreds of thousands of people doing little things for themselves or even doing little businesses like that for themselves and they need to buy materials and when the bigger companies uh discovered that they basically put me out of business because for a while let's say the first five years or or 10 years of our business, that went really well. And then suddenly all the big companies started manufacturing life molding materials. We weren't manufacturing them ourselves, but I would go to some manufacturing company and, uh, and say, I need a material that'll do this, 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 and that, and a whole big thing. And uh, they said, well, you know, but uh, how does that affect us? How, what, the, what are we going to do with that? And I would just uh, tell them the truth that I thought there was a huge industry, a huge market for this. And I would guarantee buying a certain amount of material uh, every year from them for for that purpose. And they said, great. So they put me in touch with their chemists. And the chemists are people who, of course, love to do anything, invent anything, you know. Right. They're not the people that are putting a stop to anything with People that decide the yes or no are administrators. They're doing some kind of a number crunching, right? Not the chemist. So the chemist worked to create everything and anything I wanted. It was great. But then at the point where the bigger companies started selling stuff, I couldn't compete with them because they would go to the trade shows, and the trade shows, to go to one of those, would cost like something like $10,000 for a booth. I couldn't afford to do that. And they were already going to trade shows because they were pushing their other materials, their other molding materials. And so for them to tack on, you know, life molding was no big deal. And then they finally even started giving life molding workshops, a lot of these bigger companies, and to suck in more people to buy more materials. And so basically my whole life molding business 
pretty much came to an end, you know, from gotcha. that. But I also had technical videos, which I produced, and those sold extremely well. And at one point, even some of the companies that were uh, making their own product would buy technical videos from me and then resell them, which was fine. We made an agreement of what they would resell for and what they would, what their net cost would be. But then eventually they just did their own videos also. So, so I've been through a lot of different types of businesses that each time it looked like this was going to be the final way out, right? <laughs> to to uh, solve all the financial problems and then something would happen like that, like other businesses, bigger businesses taking over and um, and putting us out of business because we couldn't compete because we couldn't go to the trade shows because they were too too expensive. So it's a whole catch-22. You know, if you can't get there and show your, your product, then you're not going to sell, you know. And, and then because they had so many other products to sell, Besides life molding, it was easier for artists and people doing this kind of work to just do a one-stop shopping rather than just buy the life molding from us and then the tools or some other life or some other product that wasn't anything to do with life molding but still had to do with molding and casting to do everything at one place rather than two places. Gotcha. Well, yeah. But to backtrack a little, if there was something that if you could go back in time and you could tell yourself something before you were starting that, that exhibit in 1972, if there was something that you could tell your younger self that you wish you knew then that you know now, what do you think that would be? That would be take a teaching position at a school. <laughs> no, really, because I was offered that. If I had that, I would be making like something like about 150000 to $175,000 a year now, just working like – Probably three days a week. Wow, but that and that's in the U.S. or you mean in Canada? And I know that no, in Canada, but in the Got U.S. It. It's, it's not any different. But uh, I know that for a fact because when I was a student, there was a guy just a year ahead of me who was teaching his first year there in sculpture. Okay, so I w- wasn't my first couple of years, like my third year uh, in sculpture. Uh, I mean, my first year in sculpture, but my third year of a four-year. Uh, fine arts program uh, and he only retired about five years ago and he was making about $175,000 wow but you, you and, and you, only coming in and only coming in like like three times a week sometimes two times a week some years because he would have two classes one day and then another day would be a third class and but now you teach a little bit now right pardon you do teaching a little bit now though right well, it's not no, I'm actually not a teacher. <laughs> they have you know, at, at this at these universities and I don't think it's any different anywhere else in the uh, same in the US or wherever. Um uh I'm a technician and okay, technicians okay. are not teachers. They may be teaching technique, but they're not the teachers. The teachers are the teachers who are um uh, uh, making uh, aesthetic judgments on students' work, discuss their work with them, and and so on and so forth. And then what they do is they send the students to the technicians to get them to teach them or show them how to do, how to create what it is they want to create. But the concept of the, or the idea of the work, that's what's discussed with the teacher, or if it's not discussed with the teacher, it's at least presented to the teacher at some point when they're finished. But in order for that to actually get done, they have to go see a technician, either someone in the wood shop, that's going to be one technician, or the metal shop, that would be another technician, or molding and casting, which would be my area, or so on and so forth. I get paid, technicians are the lowest of the low on the on the ladder of uh, of pay, let's say, working gotcha. within an institution. Well, is that something that you could continue to do and then eventually get to be, I mean, if you were to, I guess you'd still have to get a teaching degree and everything. Like how could you, is there a way that you could transition to being a part-time teacher? Oh, not now, no. No, and I'm plus, I'm, I'm like 70, I'm going to be 72 in a few days. Gotcha. Man, <laughs> That's well, never going to happen. What about something you need to tell yourself today? Pardon? What about something that you have to tell yourself today? 
I have to tell myself to like hope and pray every day that something that something happens for the next day because otherwise I'm in trouble. Right. But, you know, it does teach you to hustle, I guess. But that you've been doing that since the beginning. I guess that's what being an artist is all, you know, mainly about. I know, but it doesn't, it doesn't get easier. <laughs> right, right. It, get, it gets more difficult because, there... because the cost of everything goes up. And so the debts keep building. And then there's only so many credit cards you can get. And then after that, you know, you apply and they, can, and they just do a credit check. And they see you make your payments. But that doesn't mean anything. What means something is that how many, what does that all amount to? What does the debt amount to versus your income? And once they calculate that, they say there's no way you're getting another credit card. (laughs) Right. So if there are other artists that are listening to this that are struggling, that are either struggling to make the dive into trying to become a, a professional artist full time or are struggling financially, as you've described, what would your advice be to them in in terms of positive advice uh, that you know could help them get through? It's it's re- that's uh, it's really difficult. It's really difficult. I would say <clears throat> I would say if you really love to do what you're doing and it means that much to you, you owe it to yourself and to everyone else that likes what you do. And there are always going to be people that like what you do to to continue to push forward because you don't know at what point somebody might phone you up and ask you if you want to have a show or come across your work and say, we would like to show this or we have somebody who's interested in, in buying it or this or that. So let's say the Gagosian show just came out of the blue. It's not something I I would ever think, a place I would ever think of going to because they're, just, they're a blue chip gallery. You know, they're just dealing with like big name artists. But, you know... Um, Harmony Corrin had seen my work, and um, and he was asked by Mr. Gagosian to put together to curate a show, <clears throat> and and Harmony chose myself and Geiger to show together, and that's how that show happened. But that's just a phone call I got. I got a phone call from um, Gagosian's right hand lady, uh, who runs everything over there, and uh, she phoned me and uh, and said, you know, would you like to have a show at Gagosian with uh, with Geiger? And I said, sure. You know, are you kidding? <laughs> yeah, I mean, my goodness, so, of course. And he was a big admirer of your work, I read, as well. Yes, and I didn't even know that. And, you know, when I was going to, to university, I had posters of his hanging on my wall. That's so cool. When I had when I had a one and a half room apartment, and you know that's another example of what what encouraged me to continue because I didn't have any references of other artists around me because I didn't live like in New York City, and uh, you know there would be people like Bruce Connor who did some very strange stuff uh, in New York City, and uh, but there was nobody around me where I was living even though. Montreal is a pretty big city, or Toronto. Uh, now Toronto is even bigger than Montreal, but at the time when I was growing up, Montreal was the biggest city in Canada, the main city. Then it became Toronto as Toronto expanded. But there were no people around there that I could, uh, <clears throat> you know, kind of tap to, tap onto or communicate with uh, where there was like, um, you know, uh, uh, a, a deep emotional kind of connection, you know. Uh, everyone that I knew or that I did have some connection with, which encouraged me tremendously, were people like Ed Kinos, but he was like a big name artist, or other people, uh, or even seeing Geiger's work in a poster form was encouraging for, uh, to me because of the nature of the work, not so much because of their particular interpretation of the human figure because Geiger doesn't have anything to do with Ed Kinos and, and his images other than it's, it has to do with the human figure. So right. myself, I'm like that also. I'm out there on my own uh, with the human figure, but uh, I get encouragement from having, I had a lot of encouragement from just being aware of those people. And even though I didn't know that Geiger knew my work or liked my work, cause, which he wouldn't have at that time because I wasn't even known then. 
but uh it it would have been it would have been nice to know that because i at the time when I was living in Europe, if I had known that, I would have gone to see him right right and that's because i had i had I had the means to do that then because of the the big grant I was on in Berlin, and then I would have gone to switzerland and and you know and I would have been happy to meet him. I guess that's so, the weird. That's the weird thing is, like you say, you just you have to press on because uh, you never know who your fans are, and you never know when that phone's going to ring, and you never know what road right. that might yeah. take you down. Yeah, and you don't know what that will lead to. You know, so, it's just like it's just like the the show I had at the Stedlick that this guy saw, and I, I wish I knew, I remembered his name, but I don't. Um, at Island Records, and then. Uh, the Trent Reznor connection, and they at least they paid me really well to uh, use the image on that on that one single, you know. But I'm just saying, you know, there these these little threads that come along, they come along out of nowhere. You don't, you have no idea when or if something like that's going to happen, right? Right. And so, so it's a mistake to kind of throw in the towel and go, okay. There's no hope. And I know what that feeling is like because I get to that point, too, where I feel like there's no hope. You know, for me, it's not a question of uh, am I ready Am I ready to leave this world or not, you know, because there's no hope. Or can I hang in there because you never know. I'm going to go while you never know, so I'm going to hang in there. Well, and how – But I do we... understand the people like those two artists that I mentioned to you. Uh, taking their life because I, I can I can I can understand when you get to that point of how dark everything seems and there really doesn't seem to be any hope and and so you have to it just becomes too overwhelming it, it doesn't become a rational thing anymore you know what I mean right it's purely an emotional a re- emotional thing and what you have to do is you have to override the emotion you know somehow. You have to yeah. try to let the brain make the decision and not the emotion make the decision. Right, and that can be sometimes the hardest thing, but it's the only option, you know, because like you said, you just you yeah. don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And it can it no, can no. be a, a life-changing experience tomorrow or the next day. You just never know. And, and if right. you really have to kind of... of what, of what you're doing, you know, because... And, to, and the other mistake that you could make is you could go, well, I'm not going to do the work. You know, right. like in art... In, in in art or in music or in writing or any kind of the arts, you know, either way, that's a mistake because if somebody comes to you and says, you know what, I read this or I heard this, if it's a music thing or if it's an art thing, I, I saw this image or that image, I would like to give you a show. We'll say we'll say you're a visual artist like a painter or, or a sculptor and then some gallery sees some of your work and they go, great, uh, we think we'd like to give you a show. What uh, what have you done recently, or can we see some more work of, of, of yours? And you don't have anything; you're not going to get that show. Right, right. You know what I mean? They don't want to have you have a show of something you did like 20 years ago, or 10 years ago, or five years ago. You know? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. No, so because then they figure that you're not doing the work, which is right, which is accurate, right? <laughs> and then, you know. They're not. They don't feel like you're an active artist. So why would they show somebody who's not an active artist? And speaking of being active, you started creating uh, jewelry, some incredible pieces of jewelry, brooches, earrings, uh, all different varieties. I wanted to ask you how people can view your art and how can people go to your your store to shop that. You know, how can we kind of follow your journey and be a part of it with this? Well, my son is going to try to do um, this uh, this store with uh, the Instagram. Okay. You know, so we'll see uh, how that goes. Um, but otherwise, what normally happens? Let's say if they go if they go to my name and they get to our business, which is Pink House Studios, uh, they will see a link to to my artwork. And, but they don't have to even see that link of Pink House Studios. If they just Google markprint.com, they can get to my website. So on my website, my work, uh, all of my sculptures, not all, but most of my sculptures are there, and they're, and they're in a chronological order, which is, which is the latest piece uh, that I've done is up there. 
um, not the ones I'm working on, but, you know, the, the finished works. And they can see if it's available or not available. If it says not available, it means it's in a collection, a private collection or a public art collection. And if it's available, it means it's for sale. So people can phone and just uh, and just ask what the price is if they're interested. And that goes for your jewelry as well? And they can go to the jewelry. Yeah, they can see my jewelry also if they Google Mark Print Jewelry. Or, or if they just go to markprint.com, they'll have a choice to go to different different things. So let's say Guillermo del Toro, that, who bought one of my pieces, he was in Toronto doing a film <coughs> and uh, that's a number of years ago now and uh, a photographer working with him asked him if he knew my work and he said no and he and the photographer said well maybe you should check him out because you might be interested so he did and he saw one of my pieces that he liked we had a nice conversation by email back and forth um, at the beginning, I didn't know who he was because he just emailed me, just asking about a piece, and it meant nothing to me because I could get these emails off and they don't ever lead to anything, you know. But right. uh, and he just signed it GP, which meant nothing to me, you know. But then we had a conversation back and forth, and I finally figured out that it was him. So uh, because it didn't occur to me at all, and then uh, and you know and. Uh, the conversation was sort of like he asked me the size of the piece, but I'm sure the size of the piece was on the website, but maybe he didn't notice it or something. And I said, it's uh, it's a small piece because it's a figure on a salesman sample couch, which is a, like a reclining nude on a salesman sample couch. Well, salesman samples are not like doll house things. They are actual uh, miniature repli- replicas of the real thing, you know, so – meaning the couch will be made in the same quality leather, the same way as a full-scale couch would be made. And uh, this is how salesmen, how salesmen uh, sold things in the past, go door-to-door to door and uh, or send out images and so on and so forth. And uh, that would, turned out to be great because he said, oh, I love salesmen samples. So he obviously was aware of these type of things. And uh, yeah, he bought. He just bought the piece. He said, uh, "I want to buy the piece. I'll have my uh, uh, my secretary in LA send you a check." And um, and that was it. You know. And I sent his piece to to LA. That's so cool. So and then that piece was in his traveling show, which was called uh, Guillermo at Home with Monsters. That started in LA at the uh, Los Angeles County Art Museum, and then it went to Minneapolis and. Um, then after that, it went to the Art Gallery of Ontario in Canada. So and that's and I met him in in Toronto because I went to that show, um, and uh, and and met him there. Yeah, what an interesting guy. Well, the the last thing I want to ask before we wrap up is, you know, there's it seems like that you always believed that things were leading towards something. That even when you faced obstacles, you always you know had this faith that you were on this path. It was leading to a certain destination and, you know, that you always had to rely on certain ways to stay calm and to, and to try to keep your mind relaxed when, uh, even though you felt like things were going out of control sometimes in the background. So that said, are there any final thoughts that you want to give about things that have worked for you to, to try and stay positive, to try and, uh, keep on this journey and, and keep the faith in yourself and, and in your talents and uh, in the, this path that you've chosen for yourself. Yeah, I go, I go into my studio. It's the only thing that, you know, where I can find uh, a solace, you know, I, it's like a fantasy world, right? I go into my studio and when I'm working, I, I feel great, you know, even though I know that outside of my little workspace here, uh life is is like a, a big lottery right Basically, whether yeah. you're gonna make it through or not and so even though you have that at least you know and i think that you kind of share that with most artists is that you do have to create this fantasy world you have to create this world that you feel inspired by right yeah and and the fact you know and this is why I think that 
you know, because of the way I work, that I don't work towards a finished end goal image. That that it's a journey of discovery, and I, and I'm I'm trying to see where it takes me. Okay, as mm-hmm. opposed to having well, what I'll call tunnel vision. You know what I mean? <laughs> Not that that's bad. As I said before, you know, every artist has to choose his or her own direction and what might works for them. But for me to have an end finished image as my final goal is a kind of tunnel vision, and that doesn't work for me. It doesn't right. inspire me, you know. What inspires me is not knowing where it's going to go, and that's what keeps me going at it is because I'm curious. My curiosity overrides everything else to the point that I need to see where this is going to take me, and and that's my fantasy world, you know, that, that basically keeps me going. You know, that is curtailed to a great extent by... Uh, limited funds, but I can work on smaller pieces and where materials are not a big expense or objects that are not a big expense or objects I've had around for a long time, but I haven't gotten around to. And I spent that money so long ago, I don't even remember how much it was, <laughs> but I still have them. So there's something there to uh, <clears throat> to keep me interested. And I always work on more than one piece at the same time. So I always have different things that I can go back and forth between. So even if I'm having a problem with a piece or working something out, I can go on to something else and come back to it and, and go back and forth like that. So there's a there's a certain incentive, but it's like an inner drive. So people who have that inner drive to want to create, you know, really should honor that and, and really have, and they owe it to themselves and everybody else who... who who likes them or loves them and likes and loves their work. It's, you know, I mean, you know, if you use whatever, whatever crutch basically that you can to keep you going, you know what I mean? Right. Because, so, you know, not... if you have a, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, whatever, even if it's not a serious relationship, you know, you can, you can, you can make them be, the reason to continue, you know what I mean? If they encourage you or they like you or they like your work, you know? It's like you just you just build a fantasy world that helps you go from day to day. And like you said, I think that really what it comes down to is keeping your mind active so that you don't, you know, unintentionally or intentionally stumble into those dark tunnels. Yeah, you have to you have to get out of those things, you know. And and the only way I can get out of those things is to go to the studio. It doesn't help solve the problem because as soon as I'm out of the studio, I'm faced with it again. So, uh, but at least you know it it's given me a reprieve from it. You know what I mean? So it doesn't drag me down 24 hours a day. You know, right? But I and can't you're say, but I can't say that every night I go to sleep and every morning when I wake up, the first thing I don't think about is money because it is. <laughs> But your creations are the one thing that that are the key to to unlocking that. You know what I mean? The more that you work and the more that you, that you are creating new objects, the more that allows more doors to potentially open. Yes, yes, it's that. So you work towards uh, a potential, you know, and uh, yeah, you know. So if you stop working uh, and you're in that state, and and your work is what you're living for, you're screwed. Well, I hope I hope I'm helpful to to some people. Basically, <laughs> I think absolutely. I think that there's a lot of people that struggle with the same the same problems. Is, is how do you continue to create if there's a financial you know issue in the background? Yeah, you, and you have to just make it your priority. You know, essentially, you have to yeah. Make make it your priority, and you know, because all life is about priority. It doesn't matter what you do. You know. My son says to me, I don't read enough books or anything. I say, you know what? I, I know I don't, but I don't have the time. I don't want to do that. I, it's life's a priority. If I wanted to read more, I would read more. You right. know? But I don't. I'd rather be in the studio working, or I'd rather be doing this, or I'd rather be doing that. Or so finally, I have to get some sleep also. And if I pick up a book at night, when I get it to bed, I'm just going to fall asleep before I even get to word number three. Cause I'm I, know too the, tired. I know the feeling. <laughs> I definitely know the feeling. <laughs> Well, Mark, I, I cannot thank you enough for, for sharing your time with us and sharing your stories. And uh, I'll let you sign us out here. You know, if there's any uh, any last things you want to say for anyone that may be struggling that's listening, I, I really appreciate it. And, 
Again, I want to encourage people to go to markprint.com and, and check out his amazing work, his amazing jewelry, and to stay tuned for, for his Instagram uh, coming up that will show you into his brilliant mind. So, Mark, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand it over to you. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it.